March's public forum topic is going to be resolved in the United States, students should be guaranteed two years of free tuition to a community or technical college. We're going to look at first what the resolution does say, then what it does not say, then at some history, then at some arguments. So for starters, there are a couple words that might stand out. Students, though, is probably not one of them. Students is an important word, though, because it checks back silly interpretations of other words that many teams might use. So, for instance, guaranteed can be taken to mean a lot of super broad things, but unless they're already a student at the college, then it can't mean just give money to everybody regardless of whether or not they go to the college. Similarly, tuition can be a bunch of different things, or could be set at a bunch of different amounts, but, again, because we're only talking about actual students, it is set there as well. Aside from that, guaranteed does not necessarily mean that it's given in advance. It could be refunded, but that it does have to be given. The government cannot really make exceptions. The resolution does not say domestic students. The resolution does not say offline students. This would theoretically apply to foreign exchange students as well. This would theoretically apply to people who are here legally or illegally. This could even theoretically apply to someone who took online courses from outside of the country as long as the community college technical school was willing to accept them. Willingness to accept seems like it checks back certain other arguments, but the fact that community colleges, technical colleges, would now be paid large amounts of money by the government per person they accept seems to imply that Khan can probably defend a world in which the barriers to acceptance are lowered. Aside that, let's talk about community colleges and technical colleges. Community college is more straightforward. Generally, on a county-by-county -county basis in the United States, they are two-year rather than four-year institutions. You get associate's degrees rather than bachelor's degrees, and in many states they have some kind of agreement with the state university system that can guarantee admission into the state universities upon completion of a certificate at the community college. Technical colleges are a little bit different. They're also intended for post-secondary education for people after they've graduated high school, although much like community colleges, it's not always the case. Some people will take courses there while still going to high school. Technical colleges are generally more skills-focused than community colleges, and very often offer a certification that is seen as an end path of its own, rather than as a stepping stone to a bachelor's degree in a similar subject. The resolution does not say that only community and technical colleges should receive free tuition guaranteed to all entrants. I don't think that Perkin advocate that it should be given to more than that necessarily, but I do not think that Khan can go farther than Pro on the topic and say, well, actually it should be everyone, because even in that case the resolution is still true, just more than the resolution is true as well. We'll look at that in a little more detail in a moment, but first I want to talk about some background here. In the 1940s, most people stopped at a middle school education. Getting a high school diploma meant you were one of the most educated people around, not just in the country, but in the world. You usually didn't need to get one, though, except for certain specialized fields. After World War II, the GI Bill occurred. The GI Bill gave a lot of government money to large numbers of returning veterans, enough so to make college a normal path. By the 1950s, college was fairly common, and furthermore, everyone was expected to graduate high school. You couldn't really get by on just a middle school education anymore, even if you wanted to enter a trade. By 1980, you needed a bachelor's degree to make above average income. High school diploma would no longer statistically put you above the 50th percentile. By the year 2000, a master's degree had replaced the bachelor's degree as what you needed to have a better than even shot of making above median income. 
at the same time, the significance of previous degrees changed. In general, a bachelor's degree now means what a high school degree used to mean. Not necessarily that you were an expert in that field, not necessarily that you were very educated, but that you were capable of showing up on time, that you were capable of doing work, that you were capable of meeting deadlines, that you were capable of delaying gratification, that you were capable of generally being a decent and teachable employee, even if you may not ever use the skills you learned from obtaining the degree in your job, and many people do not. Common advice these days is that it doesn't really matter where you go for your undergraduate degree, so long as it gets you into a good master's program or other post-baccalaureate program. With that said, it's important to look at this change happening from two different perspectives. One perspective is that as people are working longer, as retiring gets pushed to a later age, as more technology is used, as each worker is expected to learn more, and as technological literacy becomes more important and everything becomes more interconnected, there is just so much more to learn that compressing it into 12 years is no longer practical. The other way of looking at it is that people really don't learn much more in 14 or 16 years now than they learned in 12 years before, but that as new ways to charge for pieces of paper that say you are a certified competent worker drone become more and more expensive, people need to find some way to draw out and delay the process of obtaining those, and education simply gets diluted and watered down. Both of these perspectives have some truth to them. They're not mutually exclusive. It is probably somewhere in the middle, though obviously different sides of this topic would rather emphasize one of the two narratives over the other. This topic may have been about a bunch of different things originally, but as of the State of the Union, this topic is functionally about Obama's plan. And the reason I say that is because if the resolution does get done, it's hard to imagine a world of the pro that follows a different track than that. Generally speaking, it would be easier for one team to hold the other to debating that, but the other team to say, no, we should look at some purely theoretical situation that one of us would have to fear will actually come into place. The resolution could be looked from a purely normative should perspective, but even so, that gives very little idea of how to compare the world of the pro to the world of the con, whereas this actually outlines a plan which both teams can talk about. Not plan, plan, as in the public forum rules type of plan, but as in a clear course of action. Now, this is not the first time that Obama has given a State of the Union in which he has supported a course of action that is far more moderate than the one he originally wanted, that many of its most ardent proponents say only goes partway as far as it needs to, and that many of its fiercest critics say is simply tantamount to socialism. This isn't the first time it's been seen as an incremental reform that could potentially lead to something better in the long run, but that in the short term, even people who want it see it as probably a payoff to a large industry. This was true for the Affordable Care Act, and it is very analogous to here as well. The ACA was originally supposed to be single payer, but that was not politically feasible. The compromise was seen as both a payoff to insurance companies and a necessary first step. Similarly, many of the people who argue for the resolution do not argue just for the resolution. They are arguing for making college in general free rather than making one subset of college free. And many of the benefits they claim will only happen at that point. At the same time, it's important to recognize that even if they do manage to do that, it's still going to be a long way down the road, and it's still not going to be benefits the protein can claim in this round. This means that pro is very often going to be behind con on this topic in the battle of evidence, simply because con's authors believe more firmly in the course of action they are arguing for, whereas pros are saying, well, I guess this is okay, and it could lead to something better in the long run. We really shouldn't stop here, and we'll then often go on to give reasons why it is not good enough. Smart con teams on this topic 
will make arguments that are built mainly off of the idea that there is a gap between these two forms of college and it is very important to pay attention to what gets left behind. That is, they'll talk a lot about how making the first two years free, but not the last two years, is going to create unique problems that Pro cannot defend by arguing for free college or free first two years in a vacuum. So, as an example of this, one thing this is going to do is it's going to make people a lot more reluctant to go to a traditional four-year bachelor's program if they can be accepted into it starting their junior year, but get their freshman and sophomore year free. This is especially the case dealing with state universities, which in many states have systems which require them to accept people who have graduated from a community college, especially if they meet certain requirements in the process. Generally speaking, they would much rather the students go there for four years and pay two extra years of tuition than functionally go for a half price. This is also the case for private universities, which if they are not going to accept community college applicants, definitely need to either make it clear that their education remains undiluted and is superior to publicly funded education in general, or need to find some way to accept them and still get their costs back. And there are a few different ways this could happen. For instance, a university might accept a larger number of community college students after they get their associate's degrees, but structure its program so that it takes them five or six years to graduate instead of four by making the requirements for transferring from a community college particularly onerous. On the other hand, you might see certain universities simply stop admitting students from community colleges, which would both cheapen the value of the associate's degree as a stepping stone to something else, while at the same time making a very clear reason to pay the tuition for your freshman and sophomore year instead of skipping out. When you're looking at those types of arguments in particular, it's not so much identifying that this backlash will happen so much as some kind of backlash is inevitable. This is an extremely profitable industry that will find a way to maintain its advantage in the market that it has right now, regardless of how much money the government throws at the first two years of college. From there, another thing that will be worth looking at is how this affects competitiveness. And I mean this on three levels. Competitiveness internationally, competitiveness between companies, and competitiveness between employees. In terms of international competitiveness, this is the main pretext that was given in State of the Union. It's one that a lot of pro-authors will talk about. The idea that a better educated population will let us compete better for skilled jobs overall. It will reduce the need to use visas to fill certain fields, especially if we can use people with degrees from technical colleges to do the same thing. Very often, a technical certificate that is not a degree is still enough to give you everything you need to actually do work in the field, if not understand some of the theory behind the work or the background behind the work, or to get a proper or liberal grounding in writing about the work, but at the same time, still definitely enough to do the work. So for instance, somebody who went to a technical school for electrical engineering could potentially be just as good at it from the industry's perspective as somebody who spent four years getting a bachelor's degree in the same thing with less hands-on experience, more theoretical discussions, and more electives. Aside from that, another thing that's worth keeping in mind when you are looking at competition is competition between companies. So the idea that there's a better educated workforce, more innovators, more people who they can hire. As a result, this is going to mean that they'll all be trying to get good applicants, but now they'll all be able to get good applicants. So rather than simply coming a question of, well, we have the manpower and we don't, or our workers are educated enough and your workers are, multiple companies will have educated workers who can help them develop new products, innovate, and compete with each other. The third kind of competitiveness is the kind that Khan products talk about most, and this is competition between workers. 
namely that companies will not become more competitive, that countries will not become more competitive, but that workers will have to compete with each other for the privilege of working for the company. Right now, most people who have a bachelor's degree graduated from college end up working a job that does not actually require a bachelor's degree. And there are one of two reasons for this. Either the job functionally does require a bachelor's degree, but by listing it as not, they know people with degrees will apply for it anyway, and they can pay less for the job with the absence of a degree requirement. Alternately, it might be a job that literally has no requirement for a bachelor's degree whatsoever. But at the same time, there are enough applicants with bachelor's degrees who are willing to work as though they hadn't gotten one, that they might as well hire one. This doesn't mean that the bachelor's degree was a total waste necessarily, because the person who was able to get this low-paying job with the bachelor's degree was able to get it in place of someone with a high school code because they had the bachelor's degree, even though they theoretically shouldn't have needed to get the job. It is also the reason the person without it did not get the job. So just to use an easy example, someone graduates from college, goes to work at Starbucks. Their degree is probably not going to make them any better at pouring coffee or misspelling people's names on coffee cups, but what it is going to do is make them more likely to be hired over somebody with just a high school diploma, who is qualified enough for the job, but still less qualified than the other person who is competing for it. If right now there is a shortage of jobs that require degrees, the solution to workforce competitiveness for the sake of the workers is probably not more degrees, unless doing so will create more jobs. On the other hand, it certainly does create a lot of competition between workers for the same job, which is wonderful news for companies that would love to be able to keep wages low. Well, there's 10 times as many of you who want this job as I can give jobs to. Okay, let's see what you do. You're willing to work for 20% less. How about 30% less? And so on and so forth until it's enough that they've got just enough to take the jobs. So at that point, you get a situation where the added education is not necessarily doing anything in and of itself because the education is not being valued by the companies. When we're talking about the value of education, we probably also want to talk about the higher education bubble. In economic terms, a bubble is where excessive investment in something artificially inflates the value of it again and again and again in a positive feedback loop up until it bursts. So examples for this might be the dot-com bubble of the 1990s, the subprime mortgage, mortgage bubble of last decade, and the higher education bubble. When we're looking at the higher education bubble, we are looking specifically at how many for-profit universities have basically developed into businesses whose job is to collect financial aid from the government. When we are looking at these, we are primarily looking at how the price of tuition has risen almost exactly in accordance with the rise in available financial aid. So for instance, if college only cost $500 a semester, as it once did, and the government said, okay, well, we'll give $400 of financial aid because we want people to be able to go to college. The university in question might say, okay, well, they're willing to pay $500 out of pocket, and the government is giving them $400, so if we make tuition $900, they'll be willing to pay it. And so on and so forth, with both rising and rising until you reach around present levels. Some important questions for both sides in this debate. Will this resolution help deflate the bubble, or will it pop the bubble? If it pops the bubble, is it better to pop it now, or to let it grow further if popping it is inevitable? Is popping it inevitable or not? This creates some interesting places for potential impact turns for either side. In particular, just to give an example, a pro case could be structured in such a way that after hearing Khan speak, they will admit most of Khan's points they will claim that this will pop the higher education bubble, and they will claim that not doing so means it pops 15, 20 years down the road, and doing so would absolutely destroy the U.S. economy. Better to lance the proverbial blister now than to wait and let it grow out of control. So at that point, 
Well, that's just one example of how the various levels of impact turns, whether the bubble itself is good or bad, inevitable or inevitable, can be popped or can it be popped, should be popped today or should be popped later, can come into play. But hopefully it gives you some idea of what teams want to plan around as far as arguments that they may encounter that talk about that. Aside from talking about those arguments, Another thing worth mentioning is what comparisons do and do not work. Comparisons to other countries are probably less useful unless those countries also draw a line halfway through higher education, at which point payment suddenly starts. If they give free community college but they also give free college in general, then it's probably not quite so analogous. Similarly, you can look at the U.S.'s past and say, well, look at the reasons we decided to make high school freely available to everybody. And some of those reasons may apply too, but others probably will not because the high school itself is different than college and you don't have a concentration, you don't have a major, and that the shift from middle to high school as required to diploma was very different than the shift from high school to bachelor's as the required diploma. There's also the issue that the associate's degree is kind of a weird middle ground right now, and whether it would get cheapened or more valued, or simply required but not any more valued, is going to become a point of contention in these debates as well. Some community colleges might raise their standards in the hopes of actually getting their graduates into four-year colleges. Some community colleges might lower their standards just to be able to get as many people enrolled for whom they will collect money from the government as they possibly can. This could certainly go in either direction. There may be some that do either. Generally speaking, the latter would probably be projected to outstrip the former. When we're talking about projections on this topic, though, we want to be clear that there's going to be projections on both sides to conclude very opposite things. The only surprise in this year's State of the Union address was the I won them both quip. Everything else was strategically leaked to the media at some point beforehand. There really wasn't anything announced that hadn't already been tested through social media. At that point, there have been various think tanks that have been working on analyses of this for weeks before the State of the Union. They'll have the results out in time for this topic, and the results will not really be surprising. The think tanks that like pretty much any policy that is designed to increase the value of human capital, the think tanks that like whatever Democratic president does, or the think tanks that just happen to be pro-education are going to like it. The think tanks that are against government spending, the think tanks that are against government intervention in education, the think tanks are against anything Obama does, regardless of whether it falls into those categories or the opposite, are going to dislike it. There's not really going to be any surprises here. The question is what warrants they give, what their authors use. Because in the vast majority of rounds in March, two teams are going to stand up and one team is going to read evidence that says, well, this is going to clearly reduce the value of a diploma reduce the number of net jobs, cost the government more money than it gets. And the other side is going to read a piece of evidence that says the exact opposite. And the only real way to compare those is going to be to actually understand the evidence and look at the warrants the author gives. Saying, your evidence is biased, is particularly counterproductive on this topic because everybody's evidence is biased. The question isn't, is the author biased or not? It's, did the author arrive at their bias because of their knowledge of the topic? or did they start studying the topic because of the bias they already had on it? That said, it's also worth looking at this topic from two other perspectives, both of which are drawn in from other kinds of debate. The first thing to be aware of is the prevalence of opportunity costs means that counter-advocacies are going to be a bigger issue on this topic in general. The money does have to come from somewhere. Is it the best way for the government to spend money? Maybe, maybe not. Is it the best way the government could spend money on higher education? Again, maybe not. There are certainly other things that the government could do with this same money. 
I don't think Pro wants to or can necessarily take a stance on where the money comes from. I think if they do, it is certainly fine for Khan to argue there are better ways they could be spending this. I do not think Khan gets to pick where Pro's money comes from, and I do not think that Khan necessarily gets to advocate to get spent on something that it isn't otherwise. But if Khan can find evidence that says doing this would probably cut funding from X, then that could certainly be a reason for the Khan side. The other thing is this topic could be talked about in terms of political backlash as well. Even if the Khan team concedes that doing this is good, they could argue that doing this will cause bad political consequences otherwise. That because of partisan politics, there would be a backlash to this, which would result in one of several things that Congress could certainly do to undermine the economy, or undermine higher education, or undermine secondary education, or otherwise undermine one of the internal links to pro's impacts, thereby outweighing them without ever actually touching the direct clash of the topic. This can possibly happen. It can certainly be answered in ways as well. When doing so, it's still a question of, is this unique? Does this link directly to the resolution? Is the impact avoidable or not? Can we turn it? It's pretty much like any other disadvantaged debate, but the link is going to be either backlash or political capital. Backlash as in, if this is done, Congress will defund X or will do Y. Political capital as in, if this gets passed, then Obama will become even more of a lame duck than he already is, and will get even less support from Congress than he already gets, and will therefore be unable to do Z. The second is far more tenuous at this point in this administration than the former. I think political capital arguments are probably a lot weaker on this topic than arguments just about backlash from the other side of the chamber. When you are looking at this topic, it's going to be a question of how will existing higher education respond? Who will be recruited by community colleges to do this? Will this degree be more valuable or not? What is the place of the associate's degree in the world of the pro versus the world of the con? And what direct benefits, other than just more jobs in higher education, is pro going to be able to claim off of having more people enroll online or in person, in class at these institutions. Overall, I think this topic probably leans slightly con, simply because the people who are arguing pro would say this isn't enough to actually do what it needs to do, while the people who are arguing con can think of lots of reasons why we either shouldn't stop halfway, or we shouldn't start going halfway. It's definitely a winnable topic for the pro side, the pro is going to have to be a lot more careful about how they spin evidence, which sources they mix with each other, and how they deal with which impacts they want to pick in later speeches, especially in terms of degree devaluation in the higher education bubble than Khan is. If you have any other questions about this topic, certainly feel free to leave them in the comments. I will try and get back to you promptly. Thank you for listening.